I'm at Kansas State University. Uh, we have a group of clinical pharmacologists there. We have uh, a large food animal group, and this is an area of great interest to us. Uh, Morgan Scott will be on the program tomorrow, and I flew up together. He's at K-State also. And so this has become uh, kind of my vocation also. I, I was When Scott said when he got involved, I was thinking one of my first ones was a FDA industry meeting back like 97 or something, that's soon after which we went through the framework document. And I can tell by who nods heads in here how long everyone's been in here when we went through the framework document. So today what I'm going to do is, is take a shot at this question, and this is uh, one of the ads that the Pew Foundation put out. And so you see those, and uh, you know it was all right when they had a picture of a pig and a picture of chickens, but when they put the cattle on there, that was personal, you know. So, so now we're in the fight. You got this dog in. Uh, but seriously, you look at that and you go, is there any truth to that at all? So we come back to the, to the thought process, and this is one that is uh, out there. But what I did one day was I said, how, how would I go about categorizing the different papers out there? And I just read the most recent one by Marshall and Levy uh, that just came out and uh, look at all those references. And if I want to go through and ca categorize those references on the chalkboard in my office, uh, I've got this drawn out, and it's basically what everyone else has. So we have a bacterial population on the farm exposed. We then have selection for resistant organisms on that farm. We then have increased incidence of resistant organisms on the farm, which could lead to a higher probability of that being passed down through the food chain or direct transfer. We talk about that now. Then we could have uh, the presence of food animal-derived resistant bacteria in a human contribution of food animal derived resistant bacteria to human disease, and then treatment failure, prolonged disease course due to that pathogen being resistant in the human. So that's my, my version of, of how those things go. And so I, uh, if we go back to 152 language, I'd call this the release, I'd call this the exposure, and this the consequence. Uh, the ton of, of steps, and as Steve said, there's, we all make different assumptions in there. So as a pharmacologist, I'm going to look at this today. My piece to kick this off and stir up some thought is going to be a view of the release. And I'm going to use the tetracyclines as a specific group on how I go through and look at things in these. And to me, it's one way of looking at them. And we end up finally with trying to come up with, uh, with what really happens out in the field. But up to then, until we fill in some of those data gaps, we end up with substitution variables. Uh, and since I couldn't get a radiology res residency, I went to pharmacology because if you really want to be able to read Smoke and Magic, it's radiographs, man. That's where it's at. Because I spent my whole senior rotation going, yeah, I see that, I see that. And I, I'll admit I really didn't. So, uh, so if we're going to talk about release, we're going to have to define and evaluate these factors. The antimicrobial pressure. And antimicrobial pressure isn't simple. Antimicrobial pressure related to resistance involves both the extent and the duration of exposure. And exactly how those play off of each other, I'm not that sure. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, the bacteria of interest, I agree with Scott that our discussion should be specific to bacteria of interest. And we get into genomes, and we get into genetic transfer between them, uh, which is also important to discuss, but that we should start with the bacteria of interest. And then the interaction between the antimicrobial and bacteria of interest. Some of these, uh, as a pharmacologist, when I get confused, the only people I really know who completely understand these interactions in all areas of the bodies work in the sales departments for pharmaceutical companies. So whenever I need to know that, I call them and get lined out on exactly how these work in the church. It's getting nasty already, isn't it, Scott? I'm sorry for setting the tone so early. I got up really early, and I'm just in a bad mood. And then the outcome of this interaction. So we're talking about how does this interaction work? How does this come out? Uh, when we start talking about therapy, uh, one of the coolest things I think that's come up since the 90s and has kind of spun out of evidence-based medicine is the number needed to treat. How many would we need to treat to make a difference in one animal? And you do that by springboarding off your attributable reduction in risk by looking at clinical trials. and. And the NNT is always in, re in reference to a specific set of criteria and may not include a lot of things. For example, in respiratory disease in cattle, if you look at pivotal studies and published randomized controlled prospective 
uh, mass trials. Uh, the number needed to treat to prevent a, a treatment failure in respiratory disease in cattle is two to prevent a dead is about six. And you can come up with those kinds of data as median numbers across an array of studies. But to prevent resistance or cause resistance, I'm not sure I have a number needed to treat, and it goes back to some of the things we've already talked about, some of the difficulties. In that. So, and then the definition of resistance, which is someone who served on the CLSI committee that defines SI and R. I find that resistance, uh, when I think of that, I think of about a 1999 article, and it was out of Cornell called Unskilled and Unaware of It. And I find that the least, the less people understand the criteria for classifying susceptible, intermediate, and resistant, the more sure they are of what resistance is. And I think once you understand all the, all the things that go into defining susceptible or resistant and how narrow those criteria are, and we start throwing around SIRR as if it's a standard of that bug, of that drug, we get into problems because it, it's about the species you're talking about, it's about the infection, it's about that interaction. And then also the concern about transfer of resistant bacteria or transmissible resistant ones. So all those come in there. So we talk about therapeutic and subtherapeutic. Uh, and we get confused as to the reason for this classification. So is it because it's therapeutic intent? Is it because the probability of selection for resistant bacteria, or is it about societal justification? So if you look at subtherapeutic, therapeutic, everyone kind of agrees that, I don't know if I can say but everyone, but if we were to throw one class of, in a subtherapeutic category, it would probably be growth promoting. Improve, improvement in rate of gain, improvement in uh, feed efficiency. I would hope that everyone would throw therapeutic uses in the therapeutic category. Okay, where a lot of people differ is on purposes for control or prevention of disease, in which I side with the uh, ABMA and FDA and classify those as therapeutic. And then I thought, uh, Here's the FDA CVM approval classifications that we talk about, prevention, control, therapy, and treatment, increase in rate of gain, and increase in feed efficiency. So we make these things about which ones, and there's some that propose the feed uh, growth promotion is the evil ones, just lop them off. And so then I got to thinking about classifications by the bacteria and realized that they really don't care. Uh, what we term the uses for, it goes back to uh, duration and extent of exposure, and I'm not sure I have the magic the magic combination there, but I'm pretty sure that both extent and exposure play a role in how much we select for resistance. And I, you really didn't have time, or you probably didn't have the interest to go through a slide set on my conceptual model of resistance, but uh, Peter Davies said it back in 97 uh, uh, at a SEBA sponsored conference that it's not about the survival of the fittest, it's about the survival of what fits. So when we change the definition in the environment of what fits the best, and there's a group in that environment that can take advantage of that fitness change, then we make a selection decision. And then we're all into how much of the selection criteria that is and how long it's applied. So we're going to use tetracycline as an example. So there's nothing more a clinical pharmacologist likes than a captive audience to beat you with uh, pharmacodynamics, kinetics, and things like that. And I will fly infinite numbers of miles to obtain that captive audience that, that is not going to fill out the teacher evaluation. So let's talk about pharmacodynamics a little bit. This can kind of drive me crazy a little bit. When I hear people talk about a class of drugs as time above MIC or peak dependent or my favorite can't figure out what to call it, so we call it AUC to MIC classification. Uh, we can have a few beers in the parking lot and wrestle about that later, but uh, I see AUC, MIC as, as being a pharmacodynamic criteria that we select when both CMAX and uh, time above MIC have equal criteria. And there's a lot of different studies they use, rat, uh, rat or mouse thigh infection models, peritonitis models, in vitro kill curves, et cetera, to come up with these. Uh, the whole point of this 
about these different and MIC here is the minimal inhibitory concentration for some that may not be uh, well acquainted with that. And that's the minimal concentration it takes to inhibit growth over an 18 to 24 hour period in the lab. It doesn't necessarily kill the bacteria, but it inhibits growth. So we've got MICs in laboratory broth, and now we go out and look at and act as if the drug would act the same way in the gut, or it would act the same way in the lungs, or a muscle infection, or wherever, or a lung infection. And it might, but MICs and breakpoints, which allow us to say SINR, which we'll talk about in a minute, are really surrogates for what we think will happen in the animal for specific. So the pharmacodynamic part of, well, it's got this concentration this long in the gut or the rumen or somewhere in the animal, and that means this in relation to the MIC can get us into some trouble. So the, the message from a clinical pharmacologist is we can do some prediction to guide us here, but the ultimate outcome is what happens in the animal with clinical testing of the compound. Uh, oh, already beat that first. Okay. So what is resistant? SINR. When a breakpoint is established that says it's susceptible, intermediate, which is kind of like the warning track on the end of a, around a baseball field that tells you if you're running for a fly ball over the back and your foot goes off grass onto the dirt that you might want to prepare for a collision, that is an eye is telling you you may want to retest if you really want to know if it's S or R. But S and R are based off of three types of data, hopefully clinical outcome associated with a regimen and the MIC of the pathogens involved, which can be tough to get. It's based off of the MIC distributions of uh, multiple isolates, wild type bacteria, and then also the relation of the concentrations of the drug to how we think it works. Those are prepared in relation to a specific regimen and a specific disease, specific drug formulation, et cetera, based on what's provided by the sponsor. In veterinary medicine, some of these breakpoints are brought over from human medicine as what's probably a reasonable predictor, but aren't necessarily correlated to a disease outcome in veterinary medicine. So when we say R, I always like to ask the person who's espousing resistance exactly at what dose route duration and frequency they're predicting lack of clinical evidence. Because uh, to do less is a disservice because when we say R, because if R is R, it goes back to the unskilled and unaware of it. The less we know about how they're formatted, the more comfortable we are just throwing around off. So in our discussions, we need to be very clear about what we're defining as resistance and what clinical effect we expect on it. So back to the tetracyclines, let's talk about resistance genetics. We're learning a lot about them. There was a 2010 review by Thacker that showed uh, 1,189 different reported resistance genes now for the tetracyclines, 41 classes with three different major mechanisms. So we have a lot of genes that are out there that are documented. Uh, more genes are found for a lot of antibiotics on a yearly basis. Uh, what about the transfer? These are well documented to be transferable elements on transposons uh, in plasmids where they can be transferred. We talk about transfer of resistance elements. I always like to go back to if these were in vitro demonstrations or actually demonstrated in vivo. So when we talk about the wide sharing between different organisms, I always like to know where that evidence came from in the dialogue. Uh, how how it was demonstrated. I think we have a lot more demonstrations in the lab than we actually do in the animal. Some of the in the animal evidence comes from identifying genes in one spot or another and predictions of how it must have happened. Uh, not saying it doesn't happen, but I think it's always important to be clear when we say this has been demonstrated where it's been demonstrated. It gets into the in vitro, in vivo argument. So I wanted to put up an example of when we start talking about uh, subtherapeutic or therapeutic, growth promotants, etc. What I did here was uh, go to the uh, animal drugs at FDA site. If you aren't using that, it's a great place to find label indications, approvals, different things that the FDA CVM maintains. It's a great site. And then you can also go from there and go over with the uh, uh, approval number 
and then look at the uh, Freedom of Information Center. There's a lot of information. So I went through there and cataloged. And what we have here is the blue bar, kind of turquoise here, I guess, is uh, approvals for feed efficiency or rate of gain. The green one is for, for prevention or control. And the yellow is for treatment. And this is the range of doses, and you'll see kind of how I've ranked them here in a little bit. I uh, will throw up the kind of milligram per kilogram dose estimate up there in a little bit. But you can see that it's not a real clear break. So to me, to say, uh, you know, the growth promotants go, and then depending on how you classify the prevention and control ones, you'll either throw those in with subtherapeutic or therapeutic. But to assume that there's a break there where we can apply the precautionary principle and then we need to apply science, to me, is beyond my level of understanding. So I would propose that the only way I can make that decision is to establish a science-based way of evaluating it for the growth remotants so that then we have that precedent as we move up into the others. Because there's no big break. I mean, there isn't, there isn't like 10 milligrams per pound for all the treatments and then all the growth promoters are squeezed down here at the bottom. It's a continuum. And I would propose that any break in that continuum is an artificial break. So, okay, so pharmacologists. So you sit around thinking, because we're kind of like the Maytag repairmen, uh, the only time a clinician comes to ask us really is when they've got an antibiotic resistance profile with all R's and we're supposed to somehow lay our hand on it and come up with what they should use. By the way, that's 50 bucks if anyone's interested. Um, so what I did was I put together some references here on estimates of really how much percent of a dose of a tetracycline stays active in the gut. And these are a combination of mouse models. There's one down here for swine uh, where they use biosensors. And it's actually the lowest one down there. Uh, I had to go through and use NRC requirements to estimate their feed intake and then went back with their concentration of feed, et cetera. But what they were finding using biosensors that would detect active uh, chlorotetracycline in the manure of pigs found about 0.2% of a daily dose active in the manure coming out the back of that of that pig. Uh, estimates range all the way up to 13.4%. There's one outlier there, uh, about 68% in a rat model over 48 hours. But we're looking at anywhere from 0.2 to, well, that 13% is over 72 hours. So we're probably looking at 10% or less through all of these. Uh, none of these are ruminants, but in all these estimates, about 10%. So that's still active uh, due to being bound up. Uh, the tetracyclines go through degradation both in vitro and in vivo and form some epimers, and we're kind of unclear as to some of the activity of those. But that's what they could show. So even those low levels we put in there become a lot lower in the gut because not all of those are still able to be active in that gut. So we're going to take a quick run through some studies here, uh, trying to establish exactly what it would take for those to have uh, an activity in the, in the gut. I'm not checking email. I'm just looking at the timing. I don't want to look at the stock market anymore. So no, ad, no observed adverse effect level. This would be the dose it would take to cause a problem, to cause a selection for resistant organisms in the gut. Okay, and we're going to come back at the end to another issue than the gut. So we're talking about the gut. And in the gut, we end up talking about E. coli, but there's a lot of other primary bacterial populations that these studies address. It's kind of beyond this discussion, but there's uh, key bacterial populations that you evaluate for if they're changed or not in these microflora. So this one involved pulling fecal samples from human volunteers, putting them in chemostats, giving them a two or three week acclimation period, and then exposing them to these three concentrations of tetracyclines. And what they found was, according to their statistical analysis, that 0 0.25 mg per kg and less, let's write that down so we, so we remember these when we come back. Here's some scribbling. Just tell Mike how great he is. That's from Scott. Okay. 0 0.25 mg per kg. That and below, they found no observed adverse effect in the chemostat system. Okay. 
it's human flora, none of the other constituents of feces in there. So we've got a 0 0.25 estimate below that. Uh, Perrin and Guyamar used what's called a human flora associated mouse model. That's where you have completely sterile mice, you inoculate them with human fecal flora, and then you expose them to different concentrations of tetracycline. And there's their concentrations, and those are equivalent to about 0, 0 0.125, 1.25, and 12.5 mix per cake body weight. And they cited that only the highest dose was capable of disrupting the capability to resist salmonella infection in that model. So it took about 12.5 to disrupt the gut flora enough that sal a resistant salmonella could move in. At the low dose, they did find some transient increases in percent resistant for Bacteroides fragilis and the Enterococci, which are two populations that were commonly done. They were uh, much more pronounced at higher dose, higher doses, suggesting a dose effect. And this was exposure over a long period. This was several weeks worth of exposure that this happened over. So it showed it took a pretty high dose, but at that very low dose, about 0 0.125, we'll write that down to uh, for when we get later, that that was uh, capable of causing some transient changes. So one of the things in the models we see is that we get some transient changes. And it leaves us wondering about if you have repeated transient changes in a population, do you build up to a permanent change, or do these happen and then go away? Uh, Tancred and Barquette in 87 actually used human volunteers. Uh, they found that at a dose of 0 0.03 mix per kg, we'll write that down, 0 0.03, they had absolutely no effect on anything they were measuring, but as you went up to uh, 0 0.33 and 33 mg per kg per day, uh, and you would you would cause some effects. So to put this in perspective, the FDA regulatory human is 60 kilograms, which I'm flattered by that. Uh, but when you look at that for a 60 kilogram human, you would get tetracycline doses of 500 to 1,000 milligrams per day if you were put on it. So if you weighed 100 kilograms, that would be 5 mg per kg. So they were at 33 mg per kg at that top one. Okay. So we've now got some idea in these models. So let's go back and look at the tetracycline doses here. And there's some danger here because cattle have a, these are cattle doses. There's also a range of pig doses too. But cattle have a markedly different intestinal tract volume, et cetera. You'd expect different dilution rates, et cetera. Uh, to the model species, but if you start looking at these values, let's see if I'm smart enough to figure out how to use this thing. Good. I feel better. I figured it out faster than Scott did. So this is the lowest concentration at 0 0.03. We then go up to about uh, 0 0.22, 0 0.62 on up. This is 22 mg per kg. So the doses we were looking at in those other models were uh, 0 0.03 had no effect down here. 0 0.25 had a little bit of an effect, and then the one uh, no observable effect was uh, 0 0.25, yeah. So we've got, in some other models, we've got no effect down here, but yet we had effects as we moved up in the dose range. So let's look at what actually happens in cattle now, keeping these dose ranges in mind. You might pick up a pattern here that I'm proposing is that by saying let's throw out the growth promotants, we may be picking on actually a, a dose presentation in some of these for some of these drugs that may be below where we could cause an effect. So in the name of precaution, we could throw out regimens that if there is a change occurring may not be the cause. So uh, this I put in just for the epidem epidemiologists in the room. All models are wrong. Some are just useful, uh, meaning that it's exact the discussion that was just had in a question and answer session. There are assumptions made in them, but they're useful when you start seeing a pattern across some of these. Uh, these aren't presented as predicting the Noels and food animals. However, they do display a consistent dose effect relationship with higher doses having a greater effect on fecal flora during the same dosing interval. These were some very long dosing intervals. And we have different levels, different durations of exposure in food animals, which also has to come out into the discussion. Uh, changes from the lower doses were often shown to be transient, even for prolonged administration. Uh, during the administration, in some of those models, the occurrence happened, and then the population readjusted. And this gets into 
addressing something that I've meant, alluded to in the title and the little bullet points below. We're really, really good at numerators, but we have some problems with denominators. So when we talk percent resistant E. coli or percent resistant for a bacterial population in the gut, it is percent of what we isolate. So unless we actually go quantify the entire population of that genera and species, we're talking about a percent change that can happen because we increase resistance or the resistance stay the same and we just take out the susceptible which then grow back. Okay. So we're really good at numerators. We struggle with the denominators and anytime we start throwing around percents, we've got to identify the denominators to get the complete picture. So what actually happens when we put these in food animals? Here's a study, 22 mix per kick body weight and feed. This was given for three five-day periods. Fecal samples on uh, day minus seven out through day 33. And they stopped the uh, CTC at day 16. Uh, the resistance to CTC and E. coli and intercoccus was monitored. So they found a significant temporary increase in log 2 MIC. So the uh, mean amount of drug it took to inhibit growth of these two bacterial genera and species. But after quitting at day 16, it returned to pre-exposure values by day 33. And I think I've got, yeah. And here's a little flip that happened in this study. All cephalopur resistant E. coli isolates were also resistant to tetracycline. But the exposure to the chlorotetracycline caused a significant decrease in the proportion of E. coli resistant to cephalopur. There's some things that aren't as we see or it may not be as simple as we think in these drug interactions. So here's a graph of that. The blue is getting the drug. It increased in the percent, or the mean log MIC of the isolated ones, and then returned back down towards controls after release. So this is the highest dose you can put in the feed. It would be at the top of our, our group there. And it shows that even the very, very high dose at low exposure, in this case, caused a transient effect as we measure. This is a study that was uh, very extensive, and the ones that I've uh, chosen to have a look at are chlortetracycline sulfamethazine and chlortetracycline. And I go through some, uh, through some calculations here. It's a silage-based diet for the first 115 days, then they got adapted to a full feed diet. Uh, treatments were administered uh, for, at, starting at 17 days. So we had 61 days on the warm-up or silage ration. And then they were reintroduced for 42 days during the grain-based diet. So these were fed for longer than the label would allow in the U.S. of the combination product. And let me see, this was uh, chlortetracycline, so we can only feed that in five-day stints in the U.S. So again, this was very much a worst-case scenario, uh, really stretching out these drugs to see what potential effect is there. So if you figured out how much these were, this goes through how I figured these out with projected feed intake and going on rate of gain and uh, trying to figure out how much they were. It comes out to about, uh, at the chlortetracycline sulfamethazine, it was about 1.4 mg per kg each per day, and CTC was around 0 0.3 mg per kg per day. In these very prolonged uh, exposures, uh, the number of E. coli isolated on non-selected media were lower in the silage period than in the others. Uh, when you included tetracycline alone in the diet for these long periods, it increased the tetracycline-resistant E. coli population from approximately 3% of isolates to 10%. So again, we've got a combined value for numerator and denominator. Not sure where the change actually happened. Not faulting the research, but without enumerating the total E. coli, uh, we're not sure which we did. And the tetracycline and sulfamethazine alone Increase the percentage to 19.5%. Also increase the percentage of AMP resistant E. coli isolate. Uh, they did discontinue it during the uh, middle period, the warm-up period, and the uh, resistance did not decrease during that time. So here's an example where very long exposure to a, a relatively high, about 1.5 mix per kg per day, and a relatively low concentration caused some measurable changes. Uh, in percent resistant E. coli, but coming away from this, I'm, un I'm unable to decide whether that was an absolute increase in resistant ones or just a suppression of the susceptible ones and the resistance stayed the same. 
This is a similar study where they looked at diversity and distribution of E. coli with very similar doses. It was a 197-day study, and what they found was uh, they found some increased linked inheritance of AMP and tetracycline resistance genes at day 197, and also found some decrease in E. coli diversity. So those were some studies that evaluated what actually happens when you put those doses into animals and demonstrated some effects as we measured, they measured them, the investigators measured them, looking at percent resistance or a, a mean log MIC value. So to me, my conclusion is it's very complicated, but we can and do cause changes in enteric populations with oral antimicrobial use. It can be transient. And this is talking about the release portion. So I'm standing up here as a clinical pharmacologist saying, under the regimens given in these models or in these studies, change, detectable changes in those flora occurred. And in some of those models, the, it was in the models because they had the dose response. There was a definite dose response relationship when the same dose was given for the same period, or the differing doses were given for the same period of time. When you look at oral doses given in animals, often our therapeutic doses will be given higher but shorter. Uh, in some studies, the changes were transient, at least some of the categories. And to me, if we lop off the most politically acceptable category to cut down use, then we end up with a precedent for the precautionary principle that carries on as we then start to wrestle about uses for prevention and control, which to me is not acceptable. So, this goes back to a story I was taught by a gentleman I worked for who was also a pilot. This happened down in Florida. Some pilots were getting ready for takeoff, taxiing down there, and a red warning light came on the dash of this jetliner. And they became so fixated on flipping dials and switches and checking gauges that they forgot to notice the runway turn, and they ended up in the swamp. Okay, So we're... We're kind of fixated on the issue of what could we be doing in food animals that could lead to a, an impact in human health. When there's some changes happening in some pathogens in veterinary medicine that concern me, um, the ones I'm personally working with are Mannheimia hemolytica in some of these high-risk cats. We're getting ones uh, in some of these groups that are showing uh, resistance based on CLSI standards to all but one drug. And they're coming through in some of these high-risk calf groups. And uh, those cause me concern. So there's reasons to wrestle with this. One is make sure what we're doing has a, a controlled effect. Uh, also making sure what we're doing, the way we use antibiotics in food animals, helps to preserve our ability to treat our own cases. So it's not just about public perception or the consumer. It's also about veterinarians being able to control disease or treat disease. So in my opinion, the example of the tetracyclines illustrates the multifaceted interaction between antimicrobials and the enteric organisms as well as food animal pathogens. There's a lot of things that build into that. Uh, incredible effects of the site of action. Again, looking at pharmacodynamics, gut content, concentrations, especially if it's total drug and not active drug. And then the MIC of these organisms is an oversimplification that, in my opinion, will lead us astray. Uh, in, rela in relation to antimicrobial resistance regulation and legislation, the subtherapeutic or therapeutic use across all antimicrobials is, a, to me, about societal justification. And it's not anything to do with the potential for resistance selection in enteric bacteria population. I, as I learn more in clinical pharmacology, I become more assured that I don't know that much. One of the things I am pretty sure of, though, is that the interaction between enteric bacteria pathogens and antimicrobials are drastically different for each of the antimicrobial groups. And within each antimicrobial, the interaction between that drug and the bug of interest will be drastically different depending on the side of the interaction. So when we make overall generalizations on these, we dig ourselves a hole that may be difficult to get out of. I still think the relative resistance selection contribution of dose and duration is ill-defined. Uh, my last graduate student, on his written prelims, 
made this statement. I forget if it was the activity was greatest above or below the MIC or somewhere the selection for resistance stopped. And I go, oh, really? You might be prepared to discuss that during your oral prelims. And after about 45 minutes, we all agreed that the actual interactions below the minimal inhibitory concentration might not be as well defined as we hoped. That's why you work at universities so you can get graduate students in oral prelims. So I've got a little Tasmanian devil tie I wear. Any grad students out here aren't thinking that's funny. Uh, so my last slide, this brings it back to perspective. So I'm a clinical pharmacologist, but I'm still also a beef cattle veterinarian, and I have the opportunity to live vicariously through multiple veterinarians around the country and uh, with the problems they interact. And this just happened on our, on our feedlot elective. This is south of Washington, Kansas, about a week ago. This is pin L03. We just posted two calves out of this pin, did post-mortem on them, about two weeks on feed, extensive lung damage. Uh, this was a high-risk group that did uh, receive individual injections for control of respiratory disease. I've talked to him since then. This group straightened out. So whether we turned them with that treatment for control or not, or whether they were just going to go on and get better, I don't know because I didn't leave half of them untreated. I know from the data that I can make a drastic difference in the presentation of disease in these animals. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just to put a picture on it that this isn't some abstract thing we're talking about here, as we all know. And when we start talking about prevention and control especially, we're talking about my ability to interact with a oncoming disease crash. I just worked with a gentleman who had a terrible outbreak in a group of calves and we lost 225 out of 350. So I've got a picture of him standing there while I was necropsing him and I don't know if he'll survive that or not in the farm, but that's, a, that's the worst one I've ever been in. A lot of things came together to do that. But to, I, I want us to remember in this conversation that when we talk about prevention control is included in subtherapeutic, it's not some kind of abstract thing. And this guy was, like most of them, are an ag as a family farmer. And uh, I hope we made some difference in there, but I don't know.